Welcome everybody to another episode of Your Spiritual Journey. And as usual, we have a special, special guest. Uh, in fact, she's so special, she's, <laughs> she works in the field of special education. Uh, she has her special education certification from the University of Pittsburgh and her MED from California University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and a, a certificate for supervisor of special right. ed? Okay. Yeah, that's what they call it, yes. But I didn't give you her name. Her, <laughs> her name is Paulette Glover. Uh, she's also certified as a mindful level two instructor uh, by a professor from Harvard University. I'm not going to give you his name because <laughs> it won't mean anything to you. Uh, she has a lot of experience teaching students with special needs, uh, and she continues her mission to help children succeed. Her spiritual journey began as a five-year-old, but I'm not going to tell you any more than that because I'm going to let her tell you. Uh, as a college student in the 1960s, uh, she met a student from the Maharishi Institute, and that uh, got her introduced to Transcendental Meditation. So she's been doing that for quite a while, and she still continues to do that. Okay, I'm going to stop there and let Paulette tell you her story. So, Paulette, it's all yours. Hey, thank you, Bob. And first of all, I want to appreciate your inviting me here. It's qu quite an honor, because I don't think I'm that great, but appreciate that you do. <laughs> okay, when um, I said I thought my spiritual journey began at five years old, I didn't realize it at the time, but as I've aged, and I've realized that everything happens for a reason, and I was gifted with rheumatic fever, and I say gifted with rheumatic fever because of the lessons it taught me, because and back in 19, early 1952, when I had rheumatic fever, we were in the hospital for months. It's not like today. You're in the hospital for a long time. And my rheumatic fever was uh, fairly advanced at that time. So um, I'm sitting alone. I can remember being in a, it's crib like, but more like a cage, I think. But it was more like a crib. And at that time, my mother had my little younger sister and my older brother, and children were not allowed to visit in the hospital. Right. So my mother would, you know, I could, the nurse would take me to the window, and I could wave at them down below, but they couldn't come and see me. And my dad worked, and so he would come in after work and make little clay figures and put them on the edge of my crib. But the thing is, I was left alone for hours and hours, and I can remember that. But as I look back, and I didn't mind, you know, because I, I guess I slept most of the time I was sick. But um, I think in retrospect, that taught me to be patient. That taught me what I needed to do now. That taught me to be ready to learn meditation when it was presented to me. Yeah. It just taught me, it just taught me a lot of things. Because when you're alone for hours on end, you go inside. And so I think I learned at an early age. I was a very quiet child. Yeah. And I think this might have been because of that. So that would also teach you that meditation is part of a healing process. Right. Because they're, they're intricately connected. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So give us some more of that story then. What happens next? <laughs> Well, you know, then, you know, after the hospital, you go home and you're still not allowed to walk or go anywhere. I wasn't, I wasn't allowed to do the activities other kids did. When uh, winter came, I wasn't allowed to do sled riding. I wasn't allowed to go play snowballs. I wasn't allowed to do anything. And um, I would be bundled up 
kind of like, you know, in, in the Christmas story where the younger brother is like walking like oh. a zombie because he's so, that was me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. have no athletic ability <laughs> because I think it, I just wasn't allowed to do anything. So I wasn't, because of that, I think, again, you learn to go in and, and take care of yourself. So you learn self-care. Like, mm-hmm. I know I can't do that. You know, it was kind of an advantage, though, because when I got to college, I mean, in high school, um, I could do some activities, but I wasn't allowed to participate in a lot of them. Yeah. If it, you know, I wasn't allowed to be running around the gym and doing all that stuff. Um, just wasn't allowed. Yeah. Um, because I could, in the exertion. Mm-hmm. So, but... Um, when college, though, it came in handy because I wasn't allowed to take gym, but gym was a requirement. I got to go to the local pool hall in California, <laughs> <laughs> which was kind of a dive. Uh-huh. But um, I was young and cute and perky, and the old guys enjoyed showing me how to shoot pool. <laughs> okay. So, um, and then every once in a while, the professor would come down and would shoot a game to determine my grade. <laughs> I got to be <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you know, but you, it you just learn so much from those kind of experiences. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know. Yeah, you learn a lot about physics, I guess, playing pool. Geometry, physics. Yeah. You know the angles. That's, and that's right. what the old guys are trying to show me. Well, I wasn't very good at geometry, but you know they'd say, "Look at the light on the ball and shoot this way." But, yeah. but you know. And I, I've always been, had the philosophy of being protected. I've always had um, that feeling that I've been protected. Yeah. So during those formative years, uh, were you involved in a organized religion at all or a church situation? I was. My dad was uh, Catholic. I was baptized mm-hmm. Catholic. My mother... Um, didn't like organized religion, but I would go to church with my dad. And then um, I had an experience when I was eight years old. I went to a public school, and the public school, um, so I'm in second grade, and all the girls are talking about their confirmation coming up. Well, my church, my dad's church, was five miles away, and no one to take me because my dad worked retail, and we couldn't get there but the girls were talking and their church was in faith city i was in bel vernon this is in bel vernon their church was in faith city and their church provided a bus that would pick up the kids and take them to catechism Mm -hmm. now we were all walkers that these are back in the days we had neighborhood schools do you remember that? Yeah, oh, we had yeah. neighborhood schools. So everybody walked mm-hmm. to school and home and walked for lunch and home. Nobody questioned anything, you know. So I would, the the bus would take us up for catechism and bring us back, and I would walk home, and nobody was the wiser. I never told my mother where I was. She never asked. Oh, you in, did? <laughs> in those days, like, I don't know. I was like dumb. <laughs> I, I don't know. But nobody questioned anything. Everything, but it was like, you know, when you showed up, you showed up. Yeah. And um, so one day, so this is towards the end of catechism, and we're in the church, and we're getting ready to practice for our First Holy Communion. And I had gotten all good grades on my work, and I knew everything, and I was so proud of and my last name was Zelchek, Z-E-L-C-Z-A-K, Polish. And the nun came into the church, and she said, Paulette Zelchek, stand up. And I was like, oh, she recognizes me. She knows how great I am. She knows I'm so good. I must have done so well that I'm being notified, you know, noticed. Yeah. So I stood up, and I'm out proud, and she said, you don't belong here. She pointed her finger at me. She said, get out of here. Oh, no. And do not take that bus home because we this church pays for it. You are not a member of this church. You must leave now. I was mortified. I went out the back door, and I'm crushed. I sat on the church steps. Now, my mother made my clothes. 
And I can remember this so clearly. I'm sitting there, and I had a yellow dress on with little pink flowers and a little white lace collar. And my mother always sewed a dime in the hem of my dress. She said, in case of emergency, you ever need to call him. So I'm sitting there looking for the dime <laughs> to call him. Yeah. All of a sudden, a bus stops in front. I thought, well, I'll just get on the bus. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so I get on the bus, I put my dime in, and because I think, okay, the bus is going to go near a bus stop that I'm familiar with because my aunt would go to the bus stop and my mother would drive her down. So I knew where the bus stop was and I knew I could walk home from the bus stop, the public bus stop. Yeah. And um, when the bus drove past it, I was like, hmm, okay. Nobody was getting on the bus. I didn't realize it only stopped when people were there to get on it. Or people pull the wire to get off. So we drove, and I'm sitting there not knowing what to do. And it ended up, because I didn't even know about pulling the string or anything. I don't think I was real bright. But the bus stop, I I see my church, my dad's church. And the bus stop there at the red light. So I got off. Other people were getting off. So I got off, and I went to the church, and... I couldn't open the door. It was too heavy for me. So I'm like, oh, okay. Well, my aunt lived near, worked nearby. So I'll just go where my aunt worked. So I went down to my aunt's uh, place of work. Um, it was in the doctor's office, and I opened the door, and she's like, what are you doing here? You know, oh, my gosh. And I tell her what happened, and she's like, oh, my gosh. So she calls my mother. My mother comes and picks me up, and, you know, all kind of heck broke loose. And my dad got hollered at. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yeah, you know, making me think that, you know, whatever. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that was... That must have really endeared you to the Catholic Church. It did, yeah. So for a long time, I was you know, really, like, hurt. But then when I was 16, my brother gave me his car. He went to the Navy, and he gave me his car. It was a 45 Chevy, and I would drive myself to the adult catechism classes Mm. and I asked a neighbor to sponsor me and she said she would so I did that and then went to the um, got my first Holy Communion and my um, confirmation the same day and then I drove home and that was it that was it it was like not a big deal nobody even knew I just did it and my neighbor did it you know sponsored but She's like, aren't you having a celebration? I said, they don't even know. <laughs> I just did it. So I felt I needed to do that for some reason. I don't know why. Yeah. But then I kind of, um, when I started working, I asked a parent if she r- would recommend a church, and she suggested the Lutheran church. So I went there, and I fell in love with the Lutheran church, yeah. So that's where I mostly did and had my kids going. and Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There's there's a lot to talk about. I I didn't even introduce your book uh, <laughs> because I knew we would get to it. Uh, the book is Mindfully Ever After. Right. Uh, and immediately when I when I thought of your bio and all that training you got in mindfulness you're certified in mindfulness for our audience's benefit what the heck is mindfulness mindfulness is being um, in the present moment being attentive in the present moment on purpose without judgment without criticizing and full acceptance and how do, how do you get there? I mean, okay. that that sounds easy. Okay, I just well, have to be here. Right. Well, it is. It's all about, you know, recognizing your body. Okay, so let's say you're feeling stressed or something. And you say, okay, I'm in the present moment. I recognize I'm feeling stressed. And you breathe in and say, okay, where am I body, in my body? Am I feeling that stress? And just breathe into it and let it go. Because not... The thing is, nothing is permanent. Thich Nhat Hanh said, nothing is permanent. 
Mm-hmm. Our emotions aren't permanent. Life isn't permanent. Nature isn't permanent. There's always change. And so you breathe into that and recognize that it's not permanent. It's going to pass, and I'm, going, I'm okay. And you don't pass judgment. You don't beat yourself up and say, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Oh, what's wrong with me? You just say, okay, okay, I messed up. <sighs> let it go. Yeah. And you breathe into it and let it go. Okay, so how did you get from Catholicism to the Lutheran Church to mindfulness? How did you? I think I've always been. What was that been, journey? Yeah, right. Um, you know, back in our day, when I, assuming you're close to my age, I'm older, but um, back in the day, there wasn't you. There was no spirituality. I think when I was in college. That's when it started because of um, the guy that came from the Maharishi Institute. Mm-hmm. And he introduced, and it was free at that time. He, yeah. you know, the Maharishi came f- and over and introdu- had, would have these groups and teach it to them, and they would just be spread out all over. And um, the guy that came, his name was David, and he gave me my mantra, and, you know, we did all the ceremony. and it was that was my introduction. So when I was in um, school, we did things like um, um, we would have love-ins and talk and have you know really spiritual conversations mm-hmm. to raise consciousness and to really find out what's going on. So I think you so know, we talk in the fifties, sixties, 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 okay. yeah, mm-hmm. in the sixties. So. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I think that was the start of the spiritual journey. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, I met one of the hugest things, though, when I, I go back and say everything happens for a reason, and even though we don't know why at the time, I was told I would get the supervisor position at my school that I work in if I uh, went and got my degree in that. So that's why I went and got my supervisor certification degree. When the job became available, it was given to someone else. Mm. I was really upset. I was devastated. The day I found out, of course, everybody's coming up to me, because it wasn't a secret. Everybody kind of knew um, that I was supposed to get this job. And that's why I was going to school for another degree. And... We had an in-service that night, and I'm at the in-service, and I don't want to talk to anybody, so I sit off by myself because I just needed to be alone, And um, which was my, you know, go back to the being alone as a young yeah. person. I needed to be alone. So I'm sitting there, and my friend comes over, and he says to me, Pauline. He taught at a different school, so he didn't know about yeah. even know about the situation. He said, "I just learned this thing called Reiki, Matt. It's just for you. You would love it." And I'm like, oh, "Paul, leave me alone. Leave me alone." <laughs> He's like, "No, you're going to love what I'm telling you. Let me. I'll do it for you for free. You know, you're going to really enjoy it." So anyway, I I said, "Okay." So. One thing led to another, and I became a Reiki master teacher. (laughs) (laughs) And I always think, if it hadn't been for the other person getting that job, I would not have been at the in-service because I wouldn't have seen Paul. And I wouldn't have, you know, it's all Uh timing, and the universe has everything already set up and planned when we just surrender to it and go with it. So that's how I learned to be a Reiki master teacher. And that got me into being everything else. I started doing, you know, workshop junkie. (laughs) (laughs) You know, Psyche and uh, Cranial Sacral, which is more science. And, um, you know, all these different modalities of healing. The healing modalities. And, you know, white light healing, which led me to, um, I met Alf Reynolds from South Africa. And 
he invited me to go to South Africa and uh, work with him. So two other Reiki ladies that I um, did Reiki with went with me, and the three of us went and spent uh, time with Alf and learned about white light healing. Now, I'm, I'm not familiar with white light healing at all, and I, I practice okay. Reiki. So Okay, it's like so Reiki, I'm but there's no, no words. It's just like calling in the white light. <laughs> calling in the white light. Okay. You call it in, and that's it. And um, so it eliminates the yantra and the mantra and symbols. You just call in the white light. Okay. Reiki was a very good foundation for that. Mm-hmm. And after you do wake, Reiki, well, you probably don't even use those symbols anymore or, or calling in the, you know. Yeah. It, you well, know. The, the symbols are there right. uh, to indicate your intention. Right. And, you, right. and once, once you can just feel that intention you don't need the symbol any longer exactly yeah. exactly so it's kind of white light it eliminates all that it's like you're already okay. there and so um i learned white light and then he um elf had what's called the white chapel lectures that were channeled in south africa so he gave me um, to be in charge of the White Chapel lectures here and then i started a white chapel lecture group and we would meet down at the um, in Southside, I found um, a church there that Noreen um, would, the, a friend of ours, Noreen, would let us go and use her space. Mm-hmm. So we did that for a while. And then, um, you know, just things start falling into place. Yeah. And I would take a course about, you know, how to communicate with my angels and how to do this and how to do that. And so everything just evolved. Yeah. And once you start surrendering, all these opportunities start showing up. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. So speaking of white light, mm-hmm. you had a near-death experience. I did. That involved white light. Right. So would you talk about that a little bit? Yes. Um, my near-death experience was in 2012, March 31st. 2012 and I was um, the night before I was in uh, I had gone to a bridal shower and up in New Kensington and on the way home there was a thunder shower I mean thunder lightning and I was like so tense driving back Mm -hmm. to the South Hills and I got home, and I was like, oh, I'm so exhausted. And I got up the next morning, and I felt fine. So my son called, and he said, could you watch, um, could wash some clothes for us because our drains are backed up. We don't know why, but the drains are backed up, and we, they had two babies, you know, a, a, you know, a one-year-old and a three-year-old. And he said, so um, I need, you know, we need to wash some clothes. Now, simultaneously, uh, my daughter-in-law's brother is a physician, and he came home to visit. And so they were going over to her parents' house to visit her brother. I say this because this was a weekend, and because I watched the grandsons during the week, I never saw my son on the weekends. So this was very unusual. Yeah for him to come over and ask if he could come over on a weekend to do anything, okay? So he came over with the clothes, and he brought his dog. And everything was fine, and he was ready to leave, and his hand was on the doorknob of, of the condo I'm in. And all, I'm sitting on the steps down, and all of a sudden, boom, I'm drenched. I mean head to toe, drenched, water dripping off of me. And he's like, what? what's wrong? I said, I don't, I don't know. And I crawled up the steps, and I laid on the couch. And I had a blanket on the couch. And he said, something's wrong. I said, oh, I'll be fine. Probably I ate something last night. Um, I'll be okay. And he said, I'm, I'm not leaving. You know, something's not right. 
Well, anyway, I didn't know this, but he, he ended up calling the, for an ambulance. And so the ambulance, the first the um, policeman came. And he did, he was doing something, AKG, and I said, what are the results? And he said, they're inconclusive. Well, I knew that wasn't right. And, uh, and I couldn't lift my arm. And it was like, I said, I remember whispering, I think I'm having a heart attack. But you can't breathe. I mean, when they yeah. say there's an elephant on your chest, you literally, you cannot breathe. And so um, they picked up the blanket, stork style, and put me on the outside uh, because you couldn't get into my place. Mm-hmm. So fortunately, I had the blanket on the couch, which I don't usually do. So, you know, um, I'm in the ambulance, and I hear the sirens going, rah, 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 and I'm thinking, oh, crap. <laughs> 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 this is it. I'm dying. And I'm kind of joking about it, but then I'm like, oh, my gosh, I really am dying. Because I can hear the paramedic. He's grabbing my arm, and he's saying, hold on, hold on, hold on. And he's on the phone saying, get the room ready, get the team ready. Yes, there's no time, there's no time. And he's, like, frantic. And he's yeah. telling me to hold on. I'm piecing everything together, and I'm hearing the sirens. And they weren't like, rah, rah. they were like, rah, rah, like, get the hell out of the way. And um, so then I realized, geez, I, I really am dying. Because even though I have an oxygen mask on, I can't breathe. And so then I started saying some prayers that I had learned. One, uh, and um, I remember thinking, whatever you have in store for me, whatever whatever lesson you have for me to learn, whether to live or die, I surrender to your will. Mm-hmm. And I just surrendered. And then I said, um, I am full of light. I am full of light. And that's all I remember as a conscious state. And then I was floating. I was floating out of my body, and I could feel love. The love is so stupendous. You can't even imagine this level of love. It's, it's indescribable. But I'm floating up. It's, there's a darkness. And I'm floating into dark. And I realize, though, to my side is a light being. I assumed it was an angel. And it had no face, no wings, nothing like that. It was just light on light, dimensions of light. And she's hovering there. And I said, do you have a message for me? Now, this is my soul speaking, my yeah. spirit speaking, not me. I'm gone. And she said, she's just standing there. And I see her holding something. And I said, do you have a gift for me? And she said, yes, this is a gift of life for you to have for now and many years to come. She hands me this huge ball of light. And I take the ball of light. And it's like a sci-fi movie where you see the light traveling up my arms and filling my body. And I could feel the light traveling through me. And as the light's traveling through me, I'm looking at the darkness, and suddenly lights start pinging on, like candles were being lit. Like, bing, bing, ping, ping, ping. All these lights start turning on. And then I was... Okay, <laughs> I guess I was still unconscious, mm-hmm. but I realized I was, um, you know, in the operating, uh, not in the operating room, but in the um, recovery room, and I heard a nurse say, well, she can go back. She's, she's a good one. She can go back, and the next morning, you have to lay, they put two stents in, and the doctor came in, and He's at the foot of my bed, and the nurse is on my side, and you have to lay perfectly still for 24 hours, which is not hard because you're all doped up anyway. Yeah. And the doctor's saying, you know, you have to do this and you have to do that. And take. And I'm like, mm, I don't think so. And the nurse grabbed my arm, and she said, listen, if it weren't for you-know-who, she points up, not at the doctor, but up there, she said, you wouldn't have made it. 
So you better listen <laughs> to what he's telling you. And so um, I said, okay, well, thank you, doctor, for saving my life. And I was covered with burn marks on my chest and my side. I'm like, what, what are these from? I didn't understand. And the nurse said, that was the paddles to keep you alive. I'm like, oh, okay. I didn't know. And because um, it was blistered, I covered with blisters. Mm-hmm. And so, um, like, okay. So my daughter must have told every <coughs> people at the hospital that I did Reiki because people started wanting coming in to see me. And I asked, what? why are so many people coming in? This is really a parade of people. And the nurse said, it's because you died. And she said, you are doing better than people who didn't go through what you went through. So this one nurse came in, and she said, I understand you do healing work. And I said, yes, I do Reiki. And she said, well, my back hurts from carrying. I just had a baby. My back hurts. <clears throat> Would you work on my back? <laughs> so we closed the curtains, and I worked on her back. <laughs> but I was walking and dressed and everything, and... Um, they were just like, wow. Yeah. So then a month goes by. Well, before you get to that, as, as I understand it, your doctor said that you needed two more stents, right? right. I'm coming to that, yes. Oh, okay. That's when okay. I said. So the All month right. goes by, and I go to, and I'm still not saying anything to anybody, because to me, it's like, did I make it up? Did I dream it? Did it really happen? So I went to see, um, I talked to Elf, my friend in South Africa, and I told him the story. And he said, you didn't make it up. You surrendered. When you surrendered, that's what saved your life. I said, okay. So then uh, Master John Douglas, who is from Australia, he's a healer. He came. And um, I went to one of his workshops, and I told him the story. And he sat back. And he said, you have no idea the gift you've been given. No idea. He said, I've heard your exact story maybe four other times. Very rare. He said, you've been given a great gift because you surrendered. And I said, okay. So then I start being able to tell people. So I go to the doctors for my one-month checkup. And he says, I say to him, he, I said, I want cardio rehab. I want to get back in shape. I couldn't do anything. I mean, I couldn't even run a vacuum. I couldn't lift anything. I was so weak. I said, and he said, oh, yeah, you can't because you have, you still have two more blockages. You have um, a 90% and a 70%. We do more stents before you can do anything. I said, no, I don't. He said, yes, you do. I said, I'll tell you what. <laughs> so he was my age, so we could kind of yeah. barter. So we made a deal that if I came in the next morning and did a nuclear stress test, that um, if I passed it, he would release me. And if I didn't pass it, I would agree to get the stents. I said, okay. So the next morning, I went in. Uh, nuclear stress test is when they shoot dye in mm-hmm. into you. And so first you do it on a lying position. They shoot dye in and take your, you know, um, blood flow. And then you get on a treadmill and they inject more dye. And so you're on the treadmill now, um, you know, while they're testing it. And I said, okay, but, you know, you have to promise that you'll stay and do the readings. I don't want to hear a week later from a nurse. He said, okay. So the next morning, you know, I went in and I had this done and I'm sitting in the waiting area for him to come out. And he came out and he's like smiling and laughing. He's like, this, this is remarkable, a miracle, really. He said, and he kept saying, I've never seen anything like this. You have perfect blood flow. I said, I told you, I knew I did. And he's like, "I, I don't. I don't know how this happened. I mean, he just kept like, shaking his head and reading it over. He said, I've checked it and rechecked it. And, you know, it's just a miracle. I can't believe it. You know, he's just like sh- in shock. He, uh, so I said, okay, will you now release me for my um, cardio rehab? And he said, yeah. So yeah. he did. <laughs> 
Well, that that's quite an experience. Yes, it was. It really was. So in in practicing Reiki after this event, mm-hmm. did you feel a difference Absolutely. in your ability to heal? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think they gave me more than a gift of life because I'm able now to, um, you know, I am able to bring the energy in and it's more powerful and um, help people more. Yeah. And some, I'm mean, even able now to, you know, um, when I call in and ask for help, I can feel they're coming in and I'm able to some, oftentimes, not always, but I can tap into a person's subconscious and find out what the origin mm-hmm. of their problem started. Yeah. So it's really enhanced it a lot. Right. Yeah, that sounds great. Well, I would be remiss if we uh, kept ignoring your book. (laughs) So I am curious first about uh, how you came to determine that you needed to write this particular book on this particular topic. Because you usually work with children. So, and this book is around marriage and relationships right. and mindfulness right. so what what sent you in that direction well i had gotten divorced and i felt like such a failure okay time wise when you got divorced mm-hmm. what was going on in your life and did this precede your medical situation and it did okay. it did precede the medical situation yeah okay um I was divorced in uh, 95, which is about when I started the Reiki. Oh, okay. So when I go back, everything happens for a reason. It was meant to be, and I realize that now. Uh-huh. But um, So the book is based on research because I wanted to find out what did I do wrong. And I wanted to, because it, my everything that... Um, from what I could find, the research about books on marriages and relationships were by people who were happily married. Well, that might be what worked for them. But what works, like John Goodman is very, you know, well, renowned for that. But what works for everybody? So that's when I started doing research. So it just actually started off where I wanted to just do tips on mm-hmm. little business cards. Yeah. And I started off with a, um, you know, yellow tablet and a marker, and I just started doing research, and I would just make my tips. And I would put them on, um, print them out on my little printer machine, and um, along with the wedding gift, I would put them in a little satin bag as part of their wedding gift. And then people start saying, you yeah, these are really good. You need to expand it and write a book about it. And I'm like, I don't know. But I did, you know, more research, and um, the notes became longer and longer. And then I, I thought, okay, I'm going to make it synced enough to get the point across the major reasons mm-hmm. and uh, problems that people have. So make it um, more, you know, rather than have it a case study or, um, you know, from one perspective, I took it from, you know, the majority of perspective so we hit on a lot of you know to be mindful of appreciation be mindful of gratitude to be mindful of forgiveness to be mindful of compassion Mm -hmm. be mindful of your emotions and your relationships on a daily basis don't take Mm -hmm. it for granted well i have to tell you that i have a great marriage i'm glad amy and i do a lot of things together and we do a lot of things separately Mm mm-hmm uh, but she has benefited from your book, <laughs> <laughs> from my reading it, and it reminded me that I used to buy her flowers all the time, and I had stopped doing that for a while. Uh, I used to give her foot rubs, and I had stopped doing that for a while, and uh, I just thought, you know, I need to be mindful <laughs> of... You know, the things that were important and the, the little details that are important. 
uh, and get back to this some of those things. So this week, she got a foot rub <laughs> with essential oils. Oh, good for Amy. <laughs> and good for you. And she got a big bouquet of flowers yesterday. Oh, that's uh, sweet. That's uh, wonderful. And the card just said, just because. That's it. You know. That's it. For no reason. Uh, right. So, you know, I, when I first started to look at your book, I just thought, well, this is all stuff I know. But it's a matter of doing it, not just knowing it, right. but doing it. Right. And that's, right. that's what love's about. Right. Just this, um, that one chapter about, um, towards the end, my mother's minister. When she was in the hospital, and I asked him, "Why? What? Tell me something. You know, give me something here." But I don't want the usual stuff. Yeah. And he sat and he thought. And he really thought, and then he said, "I make myself love her." I, you know, he he said, you know, I in the mornings, you know, she wants to give me a kiss, and I hate that. And I thought, no, wait a minute. It makes her happy. Why do I care? And then, you know, uh-huh. she's talking and kissing me, and before you know it, I'm feeling better. So he said, you know, you choose it. Yeah. You choose to stay, and you choose right. to realize this is the person that you chose to love. Yeah. Yeah, life is really just about choices, and right. you make hundreds of choices every day, and it's those little choices that... That means so much. Right. Now, there was something that you said in in the last chapter uh, that just just made me think. If, you know, COVID had just hit when you were getting ready to publish this book. Right. So your your comment at the end of the book was just about you know hoping that people would be mindful with their relationships and uh, with other people as we went through social distancing and wearing masks uh staying home a lot more not going into work right so I'm curious as to, it's, it's not over, but it's pretty much waned, how you feel we did. I think it all depends on the couple and, and the family. Like, mm-hmm. um, I socialize just with my son and his wife and, and the kids. Yeah. You know, we were kind of, um, but they're... They're an amazing couple, so they would bring out the games and make sure the kids did their work on the internet, and you know. So that was your bubble. That was my bubble. Uh, yeah. Yeah, my <laughs> bubble was good. <laughs> okay, so so you got through it fine. I, I got through it fine. Yeah, yeah, we were good, and um, you know, although I was accosted one time for wearing a mask. Oh my! I know. I was in the post office. <clears throat> where it has a sign on the door, please wear a mask and social yeah. distancing. And the post office had little foot, you know, markers on the floor. Mm-hmm. So I, um, I was leaving the post office, and I see a woman coming across the street, about my age. She's crossing the street, and so I'm me, and I'm polite, and I'm holding the door for her because she's packaged. In, no. She didn't have a package. She was coming over. But I'm holding the door open for her. And she comes up to me and she says, take off that mask. She went to grab it off my face. And I pulled back. Then she put a fist in my face and she says, oh, you. I'm like, whoa. (laughs) Holy crap. So within seconds in my mind, I'm like, I should go in and tell her off. And I thought, well, no. Nobody saw it because everybody's facing that way. And... I'm thinking, oh, I can see me on the 6 o'clock news, you know, two old women <laughs> at each other. So I'm like standing there. All this is going through my head in seconds. And a young woman come th- came through 
with two little girls. And I don't know if they witnessed it or not because any seconds had passed. And she says to me, they all had masks on, even the little kids. And they said to me, thank you for holding the door for us. (laughs) And so I'm like, oh, okay. (laughs) Let it go. Just let it go. You never know what people's (coughs) triggers are. No. Okay, we are already out of time oh. and feels like we could talk for another hour i think so <laughs> but our listeners only have that much of an intent attention span so it's time to wrap it up and part of the wrap up um, is that i would like to know if there are any words of wisdom that you would like to leave our audience with Well, I do have some words about surrendering, knowing that you are loved and the universe loves you. And no matter what suffering you're going through at the time, whatever it's meant to be, it's all planned out. You have the free will and choice to accept it or not. But when you surrender to it and have trust, in other words, there were opportunities that I had that I missed because I didn't have that trust and faith that the universe would watch my back. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's important to just surrender to whatever you happen. And if you're given an opportunity, take that opportunity. Even if you think, oh, I can't do it, it'll be too hard, or I can't, I have kids, I have this, I have that. No, you have to have faith and trust that it's going to work out. The universe put that opportunity in front of you for a reason. And I, so I think, you know, the surrendering thing, it's so hard because we have our egos and we have, you know, this free will thing. But when you see an opportunity and you surrender to it and realize that no matter what has happened, it's preparing you for something. Yeah. It, you're being prepared. We're always learning life lessons. And these lessons may not have started with you. It may have started back in the ancestors and pass through with our soul or in our subconscious mind. And until we learn that lesson, we'll keep repeating it. So we need to learn our lessons. And I think surrendering to the universe is huge. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a great note to leave with our audience. So audience, as I always ask you to do, please consider what you've heard today take what resonates with you and just discard the rest (laughs) until next time this has been your spiritual journey